coming to preach. It's really been awesome to just be a part of watching him get saved, get married. I mean, it's awesome. And uh, wherever he went, I, I know he was here. There he is. <laughs> just making sure we're on before I leave you. I don't know. Let me take a peek. Just begin. And there we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I think most of you here have either shaken my hand or heard me talk at one point. It wasn't too long ago I was up here with my wife uh, talking about this wonderful body of Christ that we have here in Layton. It's, it's amazing. Um, so uh, this book right here uh, changed my life. So, uh, if you'll turn with me to Numbers chapter 23, we'll read this, uh, and then we'll pray to the Lord that he'll bless this message. So, Exodus chapter 23, uh, verse 19. Did I write down the wrong verse? Oh, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, Numbers, I opened to Exodus. <laughs> that would explain it. There we go. Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So this is one of the truths that I learned from the Holy Word of God. And it's very important. The verse says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, as we look into your word, Pray that you'll reveal yourself in a very powerful way. Pray that you'll speak through me and through your word, and uh, don't let me get in the way. Father, we pray that if there's anybody here uh, tonight who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, pray that tonight will be the night. What a great New Year's resolution. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So... This right here is your standard uh, Cambridge-printed uh, King James Bible, a gift from my wife. And uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read off a little bit of uh, Bible statistics before I get talking about uh, what, I, what I want to talk about. So, the English authorized King James Version, there are 1,189 chapters 929 in the Old Testament and 260 in the New. The shortest chapter is Psalm 117. The longest is Psalm 119. The middle of the Bible, I thought this was really neat. The middle of the Bible is Psalm chapter 117. There's 594 chapters before and 594 chapters after. And I think this is so neat how the Lord does things. The, listen to this. So there's... there's uh, this is, what it's, this is what it says. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Yes. How cool. <laughs> Whoa, pardon me. <laughs> I'll just slide that down a little bit. All right. Uh, there are 31,174 verses and also, significantly, significantly, listen to this. There are two verses, because it's an even number. Uh, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. The longest verse is Esther 8, 9. The shortest is John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. There are 774,746 words in the Bible. The shortest book is 2 John uh, in the New Testament. The shortest book in the Old Testament is Obadiah. So you might be wondering what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the Bible was compiled for 
this day and age. From, from, from the time of the apostles to now, this is the time of, the, of God's full gospel being accessible to everybody through this book. And um, I have been reading the King James Bible uh, ever since I was a little kid. Uh, I grew up in a church that read out of the King James Bible, but the King James Bible was not the final authority. Uh, it, was, it was the Word of God, and, and using their words, as far as it is translated correctly, and they don't believe that the King James Bible has been translated correctly. So they have other books that go, they say, go along with it to explain uh, verses in there. Um, and little did I know that I was actually getting little bits of truth of the Word of God in me this whole time. Uh, I served uh, a two-year mission for the church that I belonged to, and we had required study Every morning, two hours, one hour by ourselves and one hour with, with the uh, mission partner. Um, and I did a lot, a lot of studying from the King James Bible because I was in Ohio, which is the very top of the Bible belt. And I, my first day, my first day, I, I go and I, I knock on a door and a guy opens it up and... and uh, invites us to come in. And I was like, well, that's a good sign. He wants to talk. And then he tore me to shreds because <laughs> I had no idea what was in the Bible that I held in my hand. Uh, <laughs> and, and I actually, I felt so humiliated that I had no idea what he was talking about most of the time that I decided that every morning I was going to spend half of that time studying out of the Bible so that I could, I could find something in here to prove them wrong or, or whatever. I was very prideful. Uh, <laughs> in my defense, I was only 19 years old at the time. Uh, so <laughs> I'd, I'd been reading the, the, the Bible this, this whole time. Uh, and in God's word, it says that his word will not return void. Uh, so uh, just for, for all of you out there, if you're sharing Bible verses on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, if you're sharing Bible verses and you're giving a good testimony, that's a little bit of the Word of God. And so for some people, that will be the only Word of God that they see. You don't know what it could do. Um, in the, uh, so the Bible, I didn't, I didn't know this, the Bible was written uh, by a lot of different uh, author, or I shouldn't say authors, penmen. God was the one who wrote the Bible. The penmen were different. Uh, so what I was taught is that the Bible contained uh, revelation uh, from God, but it had to be interpreted by a chosen man. That's what I was taught. Uh, come to find out, uh, Several great preachers have told me the, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. <laughs> the, so Revelation, it's true though, that the Bible does contain Revelation, and it was written by inspiration. Uh, so Revelation makes the truth known, whereas inspiration provides for its inerrant recording. Uh, I, one thing that I just, and you'll have to forgive me, I tend to get a little frustrated when I think about what I used to think. <laughs> Uh, just because, you know, uh, anyway. Also, the, so the Bible, it contains revelation, and the entire thing was given by inspiration. So that means that if God used a man to write it down, then that means there's no mistakes. There are no errors. Uh, and the, the trick for us is, is to figure out, or I guess not figure out, but we have to ask God, and he has to tell us that everything in here is 100% his word, unadulterated, it is his. And, and no one stepped in the way. Uh, the, there are uh, verses all over the Bible, and I'll get to that in a minute, that talk about the infallibility of itself. Um, so I, I like this illustration that I heard once. So uh, if you look at a piece of paper that was written in pen or pencil, uh, who, who, wrote that, who wrote that paper? Did the pen write the paper? Did the pen write the words? No, the pen's a pen. The pen lays there doing nothing. 
until the author picks it up and starts writing with it. The prophets, the apostles, uh, the people God chose to write in his word are not the authors. They're just the instrument. Uh, one, of the, one of the words used to describe how the Bible was written is God breathed. Uh, God breathed it out. They wrote it down. Uh, they were influenced by the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit. In fact, I thought this was cool. I don't think I wrote it down, unfortunately. But um, one of the things that I, that I read was um, there is uh, a verse in the Bible. Oh, goodness, if I could remember the word. I think the word was moved. The word was moved. And if you look at the, the Greek word that, that it used, uh, I forget the word, but it, later in the Bible, they use a different word, forced. It's the same Greek word, moved and forced. And so these, these people, in the most righteous way, were forced <laughs> to write the accurate word of God. He didn't want any errors in this. Uh, so in Psalm 119, verse 160, to stop breathing into this thing. Psalm 119, verse 160. Okay. Thy word is true from the beginning. Every one of thy righteous judgment, judgments endureth forever. Um, that, that verse is very, very powerful. It states two truths. One, that the word of God is true from the beginning. That means infallible, inerrant, God's word is true. Second part, it's invariable. It lasts forever. Uh, one thing that I was taught was that the Bible um, had been mis mistranslated from the original texts uh, by, by corrupted men. That's, that's what I was taught. Um, and I come to find out like, th that this is not the case. Uh, God promises to give his word to every generation until the end of time. Uh, so, he... Oh, this is the time that I want to read this out. This is, this is neato. Uh, so... The King James, the authorized King James Version, um, I didn't know this. I just, this is one of those moments when I'm like, ah, oh, if I would have only known this five years ago. <laughs> Goodness, I'm going to stop breathing into that. All right. So, King James, uh, the first, he chose 54 uh, scholars, 54 men uh, who... I didn't know this, had to profess the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior before they were allowed on this committee. And I thought that was neat. I didn't realize that. Uh, so they were divided into six companies, uh, two at Westminster, two at Cambridge, two at Oxford. Uh, each company was assigned particular portions of the Bible to translate. Each member was to make their own translation first. The members of each company then met to compare one another's work, reading the passages out loud while comparing written notes. When each group completed a book, it was sent to the other five groups for independent assessment. When the completed Bible was translated, it came before a committee of 12 men, two from each company. In 1609 AD, this group met daily in London at Stationers Hall. Finally, the work was assembled and polished for publication by two men from that group before being sent to the royal printer. By this method, each passage in the translation was scrutinized a minimum of 14 times. 14 times. Each verse, each word. And uh, God says that not one jot or tittle will pass away. I think that is amazing that, that the word of God has remained unchanged since he 
first revealed it. Now, we have to be careful, though. There are imposters. Satan is very good at making fakes. Uh, there are translations out there that take out very, very important things from the Word of God. There, there are some, and you can look these up. Look up ways to tell uh, if, the, if the Bible you're using is the proper Word of God. You can't go wrong with the authorized King James Version. It's, I believe that God has brought His Word all the way to this day unchanged through this book. And uh, one of the things, I, I think it was the... Um, I probably shouldn't say in case you have, have a holding in your hand, but uh, there's certain versions that, that they'll take the blood out of the Bible. They, they will say, well, this, this one is not eternally significant, but it is significant. They say that some other person killed Goliath. And I, I, that blew my mind. It was like some guy in Nathiel or something. No, it was, it was not him. Uh, and there are other verses that, that uh, oh, this one's very important. There are some versions that take out the fact that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And they just say, like, the only begotten of God. And that's, a, that's very different. <laughs> that is very different. Um, uh, so, the version of the Bible you choose, and it needs to be the one that God brought forth for us in the English language. So, the Bible... It, like I said earlier, it testifies of itself. Uh, Christ quotes Old Testament prophets, giving valid, uh, validity to the Old Testament prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs, uh, the, the prophecies that come from Isaiah uh, and Zechariah. They're, they're all quoted in the New Testament. And this is, this is one thing that I thought was really neat. Paul, or Peter, in 2 Peter 3.15 Oops, in 2 Peter 3, yes. Second Peter 3, 15 and 16, it says, okay. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even so, our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them these things, in which uh, are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and un unstable rest. Listen to this. As they do also with the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter just said right there that Paul's epistles are other scriptures. They're scripture. They, were, they are of the same importance and of the same validity as anything written by the Old Testament prophets. So we can trust. We can trust what's in here. Uh, so credibility and preservation of the Bible is preached throughout. These are just a few that I've, I've listed. I'm going to go off them pretty quick. Uh, Psalm chapter 12 says, The words of the Lord are pure. Psalm 133, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Uh, Psalm 78, 1 through 7, talks about that very same thing, how the statutes of the Lord are forever. Uh, they don't change. Matthew 24, 15, heaven, earth, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Luke 16, 17, For it is easier for the heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Uh, the latter part of, the, of John 10.35 says, The scripture cannot be broken. How could we trust the Bible if there are errors? There you go. Who even has the authority to say there is an error? There you go. That's a question you have to ask yourself. Uh, because if there is a man on earth that has the ability to interpret the Bible and, and tell you what it really means... You know, who, who's to say that person uh, can't, can't steer you completely away from the Word of God? If one verse is wrong, what about the other ones? Uh, the, only, the only thing that we can trust in is a pure, unchanged, 
inerrant, holy word of God. So what does all this mean? That's what I thought. I had had lessons with Brother Rod and Brother Richens about this very stuff. What did that mean? What was I going to do about it? The Lord revealed to me, even before I got saved, that the Bible was not wrong. Well, if it's not wrong, then what is this other stuff that I'm reading? And why does it contradict? It doesn't. The Bible does I mean, it does, but I mean, the Bible does not contradict itself. Amen. That's what I was trying to get at. Uh, the, the Bible teaches so many plain and precious truths that get corrupted by evil, malicious people. The world, the flesh, and the devil will do everything they can to convince you that this is wrong. It'll try to convince you through personal feelings which we all know are totally wrong. <laughs> uh, the Bible calls the heart wicked. Do not follow your heart. You'll get in a world of hurt. Follow the word of God. So one of the things that the Bible taught me after God revealed to me that it is unchanged and perfect was it, who God really is. In uh, John chapter 4, verse 24... It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. I grew up in a church that didn't believe that God was a spirit. Uh, they believed that, that God has some kind of flesh and bone body. And uh, from what the Bible teaches, that's disrespectful. Uh, and... That was one thing that I, that I it, it blew my mind. And trying to think about uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in, in one, one God, it, it was hard for me to comprehend. But then I realized, how am I, why am I supposed to comprehend it? What, what, what kind of awe does an understandable God inspire? I, <laughs> you're not supposed to understand how God works. That's part of the, the wonder of it all. God does not want you to understand him. He says his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is not a creation of God. Amen. Jesus Christ is God. He says himself, only God can forgive sins. And what's so amazing is when people come to Christ and he forgives them of their sins, they're forgiven in whole. He doesn't ever stop anybody from praising him. If he were not God, he would have directed praise to the Father every time, just like angels do. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fills the immensity of space, time. He exists outside that realm. He is the, he is the way that God is able to, to be in all of us believers at once. That was one of the things that I learned. Salvation by grace and not works was another thing that I, I had debated that with people so much because I used to believe that there were things, checklists that you had to, that you had to finish before you could get into to heaven. Uh, and in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, For it is by grace that ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The works come because of the grace. There you go. Amen. The works are a result. There you go. They're not the cause. And when I realized that, I felt so free. Yes. I didn't have to live up to an expectation anymore. In fact, God wanted me to do the opposite. He wanted all the expecting to be done on him. Amen. He promises over and over and over in his holy word that he will never leave you nor forsake you. 
and that he will be the one to carry your burdens. If you'll give them to him. When I realized that every time I, we'll just say stole a lollipop, we'll use that as, as my worst sins. Every time I stole a lollipop, that I had to somehow repay, you know, the cosmos for the sins that I did. How, how do you even do that? You, you can't. When I realized I didn't have to, the price had already been paid, it is finished. The relief that came to me was a fulfillment of a scripture. I took his yoke upon me because his yoke is easy and light. Being a Christian is not easy. But the difficulty of, of trying to get through this world is, is, is nothing when you realize you're not the one that has to pull. Yeah. Amen. Another thing I realized is, is heaven and hell is taught in the Bible. The church I went to teaches a different definition of hell. It's not a place of, of fire and brimstone and a, and a lake a fire that is unquenchable, it's, it's, it's explained as something completely different. And, I, and, and the people that went to my church didn't, didn't have to worry about going there. And uh, heaven was something that you had to, had to work for. In fact, there are levels to it in that church. And, and <laughs> the more I talk about it, the more I realize how disrespectful this, this is and, and utterly false. I learned that there's a heaven and hell. Which one was I going to go to? I learned that I needed, needed God. Not just, not just, not just for, for guidance and direction, but I needed him if I wanted to do anything. Anything. You can't do anything without God that's of any merit. And in reality, you're not the one doing it. He is. If we give all the credit and all the glory and all of the wonder of it all <laughs> to the Lord, that is the abundant Christian life. Amen. After I got saved, the Lord called me into a ministry. I was at uh, Silver State Baptist Youth Camp, uh, and they, they're amazing there. I, just, I, love, I love the environment there. It, it enables the Spirit of God to talk to you so directly. I could not deny that the Lord had called me. He said, hey, buddy, I need you to hop in, get plugged in, go do something. We'll figure out exactly what it is a little later. Exactly a year later, at the same camp, the Lord called me to preach. And he said, it was so, so strange, because I'm sitting there, and, and before the invitation even started, I'm just like, what, what is happening well, I just feel this strange feeling inside me, like, <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? And when the invitation started, I, I, I just knew, I knew that the Lord was calling me to preach his word. I don't know in what capacity. I have no idea. All I know is he asked me to do it. So I grabbed, I grabbed Pastor Butcher, who was my pastor at the time, and drug, drug him up to the, to, uh, the, the altar, and I prayed with him and talked to him. And, you know, as a confuzzled little boy I, I, I just wanted some extra validation and after we prayed Pastor Butcher says yeah I think you heard correct and <laughs> that's exciting that really is I'm terrified but it's exciting uh, one thing uh, that I learned at that very camp was that uh, uh, King David he was anointed when he was a kid he didn't assume the throne for 15 more years 15 years so I mean, who knows? I've been called to preach, and I may not be a preacher until I'm an old geezer. I have no, I have no idea. So I, real quick, real quick, in, in, in closing, um, I want to I wanna share something very special with you. Um, the story of my salvation is a very, very interesting one. Um, I wasn't saved at a church meeting. I, um, I wasn't saved um, in some grandiose uh, realization. Um, I unfortunately had the, uh, well, not unfortunately, but it was, uh, it was not a happy time. It was not. Um, 
internal battles were happening, uh, two worlds tearing at each other. Um, it would have been much easier if I would have come from a, a home that did not have any form of religion. Um, and it's, uh, I've, heard, I've heard this analogy. Um, if, you, if you have uh, nails or screws, have you ever seen an old wood fence? The boards have started to shrink and the nails and screws are all rusty. Have you ever tried to take apart a fence like that? It doesn't work pretty. Like, <laughs> it tears and rips and creaks and pulls chunks out of the wood. And I, having lived my whole life in a certain way, realizing I needed to change or I needed God to change me, it hurt. It did. And it still does sometimes when I, have, when I go to family gatherings and, and, you know, when I'm around friends that may not know what, what has happened to me, I almost find myself talking like they talk and using the same kind of words that they use and covering up because I, I'm, I'm human and I'm afraid, but I shouldn't be. I got saved in a, in a car in a parking lot uh, with a heap of groceries in the back seat. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything pretty. I wasn't wearing anything like a suit and tie. I was wearing, I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I think I had a coat on. <laughs> but the way I felt was like I was in sackcloth and ashes. I felt like a pile of dirt on the side of the road. What, what have I done to deserve your mercy? That's how, I, that's how I felt. It really is. And when I asked the Lord to save me, I, I don't know how long I was sitting there. I imagine the milk started to get warm. <laughs> but when I got out of the car, I didn't have that, the guilt anymore. I didn't have the weight. I didn't, I, I mean, I, the difference that I felt was so real, but again, I was afraid because of the, the upbringing, and I hid, I hid from it. The Lord opened up the way for me to, to have it confirmed as the scriptures say, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, I know now. And I can't, I can't go back. I'm not going to. <laughs> but if there is anybody, anybody here tonight struggling, thinking, you know, what, what, am, I, what am I doing? Am I, are, are you trying to fulfill a checklist? Are you trying to make God happy with you? Because if so, it's never going to work. You're always going to fall short. You're always going to trip. God doesn't want you to do it by yourself. He doesn't want you to do it at all. He wants you to let him do it through you. That's the only way he gets the glory. If you can lose your salvation by sinning or doing worse things, I, I, how are you supposed to get it back? Only by your own merit. Once you're saved... The Lord has you. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Look inside yourself. Think about it. Honestly, be honest with yourself. Be honest with the Lord. You can't hide anything from Him anyway. As the new year comes in, just make sure in, 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 your, in your heart of hearts, in the, in the very center of yourself, that you know that you're going to heaven. Do you know? Do you know? Because you can. Just because someone's up here singing or preaching does not mean these steps are closed. At any point, you come up here and visit with the Lord. If, you, if you're limited or don't feel comfortable, 
Of course you can pray to the Lord in, in your seat. But how is any, anybody supposed to help you if you don't make an action? The last thing that I'll say is that the Lord, he's in the recycling business. He takes, he takes people like you and me and makes us into his image. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful, so thankful for everything that you've done for us. Thankful for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross and the blood that can cleanse us. Father, if there's anybody here that is in need of you tonight for salvation, pray that tonight will be the night. Pray they won't wait. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen.